So um, when we did our initial inventory of the tape, uh, it could be of like, you know, say 60,000 of these, we realized that the next time most of these tapes are to be touched is for the purpose of digitizing them. At the time, like, you, we are still using the tapes uh, to provide access to them, but if somebody has to request the material, instead of like lending the tape or circulating any of these materials, we uh, use that as a time to digitize the content and uh, supply it. So that we're meeting, so that we're using access requests to also instigate meeting our preservation uh, goals. So because we were aware that the next time we'd use most of these tapes would be for the purpose of digitization, we uh, decided that since we had to do a, a comprehensive inventory of the collection and restore and rehouse it, we would use uh, the technical characteristics of the tape to kind of optimize the, the storage of the videotape material in preparation for digitization. Um, so this meant we separated the, the collection by um, the technical formats. We, you know, so all the data camp effects tapes were put together, all the UMAX were put together, um, you know, so that the collection could use these as kind of uh, uh, intermixed uh, collections of different production units and different collections would just use what you know whatever random format they uh, felt like. Um, but as we were storing them, we were um, separating it format by format into large units. Um, we were also separating the, the tapes by like large versus small, so that we could kind of optimize the the boxes we were getting to store the tapes in. So that way we could say like this exact shape of a box in dimension holds exactly this many large beta cam tapes, and this box that's like 18 by 4, no, 18 by 24 by 6 inches holds like 40 exactly beta cam small tapes, like very tightly, so there's no space. Like having having the boxes like that kind of prevented the case that are, like the, the prior storage technique had, where it was just like a large box filled with tapes and it'd be piled up several high, and then over time they would all kind of start to crush and collapse into each other and it just become a messy disaster. Uh, so separating the tapes by technical format helped a lot in optimizing digitization because we would set our digitization criteria specific to the source material we were working with. Uh, for instance, the Viewmatic tape, it can only hold two audio channels, whereas I think DD Beta can hold eight. Uh, so we don't want to use the same digitization criteria for both because it would be extremely wasteful to do this with Viewmatic and it would be very lofty to do the Viewmatic one of DD Beta. Um, Likewise, almost all the analog content we're digitizing to, to 10 bit. Um, we had an SDI signal in, in, involved in the workflow, uh, streaming the data, and that is only 10 bit, so that was kind of like the maximum we're capturing it. Um, we had a couple exceptions for that for some of our digital tapes. We realized with Beta Cam FX, uh, if we play it out of our, our deck uh, or SDI, it, uh, the Beta Cam FX is like an MPEG 2 stream on a tape. Uh, so it decodes 8 bit, and then it gets zero padded to 10 to go over the stream, uh, go over SDI. Uh, we realized like this, these two bits are just always zero. We decided not to record them. So in a couple, in a couple of tape formats, we intentionally digitize as, as 8 bit because otherwise we're just getting data that's not authentic. It's just padding that is uh, not represented in the source material. Um, like you know, one of the goals kind of in this design is that. Even though we have like analog and physical materials and we're digitizing it, we want the characteristics of those original materials to match as closely as they can to the resulting materials. So if the source material has two audio channels, our file should have that. If the source uh, if the source material has 486 lines of active video or 576, like that we're you know we're not changing uh, the video in a way. Or if we are changing it, it's in ways that we understand and we're doing so intentionally, like we're changing it from an analog signal to a digital signal. This is like a lofty step, certainly, but, uh, you know, because uh, I guess like an analog signal would be, um, <coughs> I mean, it's like a signal where you just have uh, values with, uh, I mean, like digital values, there's a limit, like there's a, a, a fixed size you can define the number in. But an analog signal, it's like having numbers like pi or Euler's number. Like the, they're just values that have like this kind of like you can just keep getting more and more precise. So, in um, in an act of digitization, we have to sample them. So we're just taking like a particular rounded value and, and having that for each digital sample. Um, 
one, one thing that's kind of challenging about maintaining the significant characteristic of the videotape uh, into the digital file is that the videotape has a lot of properties that it is not that it cannot explicitly uh, describe. Um, so one of the big challenges for us is like audio change channel arrangement. The tape does not really have a mechanism to to communicate how the audio should be presented. There's, uh, there's traditions to say that the first audio channel should be considered as for the left ear and the second for the right ear, but this is not like consistent, uh, consistent assumption applied to our entire collection. Sometimes the first channel and the second channel have very different presentations. And if you listen to the left and right, you'd be hearing like two different languages at the same time. Or, um, or you'd be hearing like a music only track in, in one ear and not the other. Uh, we have an, uh, an enormous amount of pneumatic tape where the, uh, there is silence on the first channel and audio only on the second channel. So if you like, uh, do the left-right presumption, you get this, this, it's just only here. It's not how the creator of the work likely intended it to be presented. Um, so like this is information that I think, um, I mean, I think like, our archivists involved in digitization kind of handle this in two different ways. Like, I think some archivists have a motivation for uh, to maintain as the greatest amount of consistency in the digital results. So they'll, like, you know, they will have like one tactic to deal with these situations. Um, <clears throat> but I don't know. My perspective is more like that. You know, this is information that is that is unclear because of limitations of the prior format. And if we have an opportunity to, to make a clarification, then we should. Uh, another case where we kind of intervene and make a clarification is the display aspect ratio. Uh, a lot of the analog video tapes traditionally they're presented as 4-3, but uh, sometimes like on a paper label they write uh, squished or anamorphic or 16-9 if we're lucky, but there's like a human communicated instruction on a sticker and there's nothing that the deck can understand. Um, if we digitize this material as 4-3, it just looks wrong. Like, it's a, it's, a, it's a value we should intervene and, and clarify. Um, so, uh, for, for digitization, like audiovisual archivists often rely on tools that are not meant for this kind of preservation work, but they are tools that have been designed for, um, uh, for like, you know, video, video production work. Give me a glass of water. Thanks. Um, <coughs> you know, so we love these tools for, that are made for uh, production units and try to awkwardly squeeze them into preservation workflows. And <coughs> in trying to do so, there's a lot of ways where the, the features that are being provided to, you know, like editors and, and production staff end up just kind of uh, encouraging human error in a preservation workflow. Um, one of the examples is in, in Final Cut, there's an embedded, yay! In Final Cut, there is a value in Final Cut terms is called real, which um, is intended to be a source identifier on the, con on the content that you're digitizing. And it gets stored on the time code track in QuickTime as like a label uh, to say this is where the file came from. The, in the intended use in production is that if you have the file and uh, you see something like a, a time code of like one hour and you're like, this is really interesting, I need to get more content related to this, that with the combination of the, the real value and the time code, you can relate back to your source material. You can, um, see the real value stores ABC2, you can look up tape labeled ABC2 and go to one hour and you see the same as you see in your file. Uh, so there's that relation. Um, but the problem is when you put in ABC2 and then you take it out and you put your next tape in to digitize, it pre-fills ABC3. It just increments. Because it assumes that like for like, you know, assistant to associate production editor that, you know, they're sitting there with their tapes feeding into a machine and they will just kind of number them according to the project and uh, incrementing is is helpful in those cases. But for archivists, uh, you know, where we're pulling out materials uh, from a collection based on priority, uh, preservation priority order or accessibility requests, like there's not any, there's almost no occasion when we are digitizing in the same order as which like our barcodes or our location identifiers are applied. So like as we would be quality controlling the file, we would see like some of the eight, the features designed to assist editors were like causing flaws in, in our resulting file. 
Um, <coughs> I'll show this one file. Uh, talk about how how these how these tools strategize to um, respond to certain problems in, in digitization. Uh, let me play this again. This this clip is three seconds. You'll see a little problem happens about halfway through. This is where we have fun, and see if she just gets stuck. Oh, this isn't quite yet. Uh, so what's happening here, this tape, this file was created by Bay Area Video Collision. I think they were digitizing a uh, half-inch open reel tape using one of those like large rectangular like macro computers and a black magic card. And often often with digitizing like the you know the oldest bandwidth material, it's it's often unstable. It's difficult to, to digitize. Like the the editing application that you're using will just stop and say there's a problem, there's a time where incoherency or a drop frame, and uh, it's like, yeah, we know the tape is uh, you know, flaking, it's damaged, it's, it's, yeah, we know that there are extreme physical problems with media, but we need to digitize it as comprehensively as we can anyway. Um, in Final Cut, in order to get it to stop waiting on you and just aborting, um, there's a box that says um, <coughs> abort on drop frames, and when you uncheck it, you get constant that's like this, where you get this kind of, um, Frozen image once in a while. So I kind of want to show what's happening under the scenes in the Quick Time container. So I don't know if I can zoom in too much on this. Um, sorry, you don't need to. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, this table here. Um, in Quick Time, this is called this the sample to time table. Uh, it has it has three records, and basically this, this file is constructed of 84 frames. So it's saying uh, that the first 43 frames are presented at uh, like 100% of the time scale. Um, then there's one frame that's 900% of the time scale. That's the one that is, like, it looks like it gets stuck, because it's just being played for a duration that's nine times longer than any of those. And then it's saying the last 40 frames are played at 100% of the time scale. Um, <coughs> this is one of those cases where it's, it's like a, a conflict of the significant characteristics of the original tape. Like the original tape, this is an this is an NTSC tape. It's like it's defined where every frame should have the exact same presentation time. The the frame is not intended to have nine times duration. Like what's happening here is that uh, I believe I believe if I believe in this case it wasn't because of the, the quality of the tape, but because of the quality of the computer to to keep up with all this incoming uh, video. And it dropped eight frames of data before it was able to, to catch back up. And somebody who was designing this capture software decided that in this case, when we drop eight frames of video, we take the prior one and we stretch its duration out by nine times, and maybe no one will notice. Uh, the, the problem here is that whoever applied this kind of intelligence did not correspond the same to the audio channel. Uh, they didn't stretch out one sample over nine seconds. Uh, so when this happens, you have nine frames of uh, sync uh, loss. In the collection that they were digitizing, this error would happen about every 40 minutes. Uh, so they, they first noticed this in a file where they had it happen. It was an error long tape, and it happened twice uh, in the same one. And after the first time, it was nine seconds out of sync, and then 18 seconds out of sync, which is very difficult to miss. Um, you know, so they were kind of struggling through the video, trying to find like where is it in sync and then goes out of sync. And if uh, like knowing the quick time data structure more, you know, you can also pick what you see. Like yes, at frame 44 is where this problem happens. Uh, and if if you put this file into uh, the info, I can kind of show how this is represented there. Um, Here it says that this is a, a variable frame rate, obviously because it's, it's different durations for every frame. Uh, I made this clip smaller uh, to, to 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 kind of isolate this one error, um, but because of that one long frame, the average frame rate gets dragged down to 27.369, where it's supposed to be NTSC, it's supposed to be 29.97. And then Media Info is kind enough to report that it has a minimum frame rate of. 3.33 frames per second. Uh, I, I guess the second that contains error, and 
a maximum frame rate of n. Uh, but it's, it's a variable frame rate. Um, now, once we kind of know that this is like one of the ways we can identify a problem, we can make it easier to isolate it when we're doing quality control. Um, Davex kind of used a lot of this to say we want a new computer, really, and got you know their computers replaced in digitization so that they're not you know wasting their time re-digitizing and trying to like work around this given tool. <coughs> but all this and a lot of other issues caused me to start getting more and more skeptical about using uh, Final Cut Pro in Final Cut Pro 7 specifically in uh, digitization context. In addition to this kind of frame rate discrepancy, Final Cut Pro would also have this like frustrating habit of just making the first and last frame a totally different duration. Uh, I mean, I think this might have happened because it's getting um, it's getting audio in first before getting the first video frame, so perhaps it stretches that video frame out in time so that it can align it to the audio that it has. Uh, but I'm not sure. It, you know, it's just kind of frustrating because it's like, I have source material that is definitely constant frame rate, and Final Cut Pro is only producing variable frame rate files. Um, so we switched to Adobe Premiere, and we'll see, we're like, let's see how painful it is in this world. Um, it was a little better, it didn't have, a, at first it seemed better, we didn't have the exact same problems, uh, but we, as we were digitizing to on compressed, we had like one crash of digitization. We kind of knew at what point the workflow to expect it, and, but it just felt so wrong to like have a crash in our planned workflow for every single uh, loop of this uh, tape digitization step. Um, we eventually went back to Final Pro uh, after a few months of Premiere, because we're like, we, I mean, getting to know the flaws of both systems and the helplessness of trying to get them resolved, uh, we went with our familiarity with Final Cut Pro as an option. <clears throat> but we were, we were using a workflow where we were capturing it, uh, tended and compressed, and then converting to FFD1. Um, we made a little bash script called make lossless that takes the source material, it checks if it's tended and compressed, if it is, runs it through FFmpeg to make an FFD1 file, and a frame MD5 of the original, then it makes a frame MD5 of the FFD1, if they match identically along the line of the other significant characteristics, characteristics then we would delete the, the tended and compressed and, and move on. Um, this was okay, but it added a huge amount of time because we're we have like one hour tape, we're capturing for one hour, and then we have to add in a bunch of encoding time, a bunch of time to uh, do all this verification. I mean, this stuff was happening overnight, but like the act of digitizing one tape was uh, took a lot of a lot of time. We weren't really, we were in a Mac environment. I know like some of the options to directly capture FFD1 uh, are in Windows, a bit more accessible at the time. Um, but like what really kind of pushed us to a breaking point is that our IT staff come in and they say, oh, there's a new Mac update, we're gonna upgrade all the OSs. And then they do that and they're like, you guys are gonna love the features. Like when you like to hit tab, you can see the calendar animates from month to month. And, uh, <coughs> you know, but we've got to digitize and the audio is consistently out of sync, constantly. Um, I mean, part like a big part of what Apple has done uh, is to change from their 32-bit uh, QT kit audiovisual uh, framework to uh, AV Foundation. This is the time when they're changing from QuickTime X uh, to QuickTime X and Final Cut X. And you might remember there was a lot of complaints about Final Cut X because it missed a lot of the features of Final Cut 7. Like these applications were really complete rewrites. They, I mean, in my opinion, they shouldn't have even shared the same name as the prior application because they're so substantially different. Um, Final Cut 7, which we were using for digitization, had not been supported for probably over 30 years at the time that this, that this OS uh, upgrade was uh, installed. So like, you know that there's pretty much no chance of support from Apple because they don't, even, they don't sell or they like, want you to really use Final Cut 7 anymore. Final Cut X has this great feature called we don't digitize any uh, tape anymore, uh, go somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, and I think they had some comments on the websites, uh, you know, just kind of being like, what, what is tape? Like, this is not part of the workflow anymore. Just kind of demonstrating that, I mean, we, we still have millions and millions of tapes that we have to digitize. Like, this is part of the, the crisis that, like, we are faced with, like, this huge obsolescence issue that, like, our, the tapes that we use to, to play back the material are, are dying. Like, you know, the engineers to maintain them are, Okay, they're like not potentially available in a lesser degree than they used to be. Um, and then, but I am really surprised that we have to add in software obsolescence of our capturing software to like all the other problems that we face with digitizing material. 
because the software that we, use, we were often using to digitize content is being abandoned itself. Um, so we were like, do we backtrack our computers and try to reinstall an older OS and keep up the raw ways? And we were like, well, we're going to take digitization on break and try to see what we can finagle using other resources. So <coughs> the three resources that we kind of combined together were uh, uh, Black Magic, uh, that makes, you know, Black Magic makes boxes like this. You put some analog video on one side, and you get like a Thunderbolt cable on the other side. This is about you know, $480 in the US, and you can, it takes in about every single analog source. Um, so it has released an open software development kit for, that is available. So people can integrate in features using this hardware into their applications. So I think if you have like VLC on Linux, you can actually play through this out to like a monitor, a television broadcast monitor. Uh, I think the, the editor mentioned somewhere yesterday, Shotcut, which is a, a like an open source cross-platform editor that can edit uh, FSD1 and Matroska, has, um, has like some of this integration so that it can play back out to broadcast monitors and possibly even digitize to it. Um, the software development kit is, is, is great because it lets, it, it like allows people to build on top of what's there. We don't need to just buy products that, you know, signed a licensing agreement and a partnership with Blackmagic. We can integrate with this our, ourselves. Um, so one of the kind of pieces of glue that helps connect the software development kit to other audiovisual tools is um, EMD Tools by Luca Corbato. It's, it's a tool that lets you um, say to this hardware that I want to get some video of this type, of this frame rate, and then you can just pipe it out into a different application. So we could make a chain of like VMD capture, reading from the hardware, and then pipe it into FSM. And once we set up this, we're like, now we can record pretty much whatever we want. Because like, you know, in Final Cut, you get a drop down of like a dozen options, and you go to pick programs, and there's not much else. And in, um, in uh, FFmpeg, I mean, you know, the list is as massively comprehensive as we're aware. Um, so then at that point we were like, can our computer keep up recording FFv1 is in real time? Is it, and um, you know, the encoding was certainly fast enough that it didn't seem to be a risk to the computers that we happen to have on hand. So um, we ended up having, uh, let's see, this is a bit small, but we ended up making a little GUI in this Mac library called Pashua, and this would just ask questions like what analog or digital input do you want to read from, um, FDI, composite, whatever, what codec do you, or container do you want to use, so we added in Matroska, MX, you know, we just, they're just putting values into an FFM code command. Uh, we listed lossless and uncompressed codecs, like we put J50,000 in there, ProRes, which is not lossless, but it's in there because sometimes it's in and FFV1. And then like some of the other options, like do you want 10 bit or not? Um, this kind of larger choice at the bottom is about audio channel arrangement. Uh, because we wanted to say, this video should uh, take four audio channels in and then produce two stereo tracks. Or sometimes take two channels in to be one stereo. Or um, because a lot of our tricks work that way, we say like, there's two channels coming in, we want you to take the second one, treat it as mono, and store uh, the other one in a like non-enabled secondary uh, track. So that it's there if it happened to contain something, but it's not being represented in the main presentation. So uh, if you look at the V-Record repository on GitHub, um, I mean, this is kind of like the original GUI we set up. In the upper left, you see uh, the frame as it's coming in. On the upper right, you see the frame with uh, pixels that are out of broadcast range, highlighted in yellow. This makes it a little easier to see like the amount of correction you need to do. And then you have a waveform monitor and a vector scope. Um, so often, like when you're using these tools to adjust the signal, like you see like there's a tiny bit of white that goes above here. Like, but seeing that little border is often a lot more difficult than seeing like, all right, there's a yellow patch here and a yellow patch here. Like, uh, we found using this kind of highlighter color, you know, makes makes it a lot more apparent like what the effect of uh, digitizing a lot of content out of broadcast range is. Um, we later expanded this, uh, so there's kind of the two options. So now there's a way to digitize where you're getting a lot of contextual information from FFmpeg as you go. So it's giving you information on like average Luma and chroma levels, saturation, 
And then we realized we could start to use this information immediately after the digitization to like summarize that. So, um, I don't know if I can explain more of this, but if after you digitize, there'll be a step where it like reads through all the collected data. And uh, for instance, if there's um, it'll count the number of frames with a illegally high uh, saturation value, where you have like a color value in, in YUV that cannot be properly translated back to RGB because it would be a negative or an overflow. Um, those values sometimes happen in digitization because the, the tape deck is, is dirty. So you'll get like garbage tape out, including uh, random values that will give you like these illegal colors. Uh, so we found by counting the frames after, we can that have illegal legal uh, color values. We can have an indicator on if uh, like the deck has now become so dirty we should not proceed to use it and, and do a cleaning. So we're getting like kind of, you know, really responsive feedback from our, our digitization system. Um, you know, I'm not a, a trained uh, programmer, but I've been like kind of trying to put this together to work for digitization, and I'm happy to see other people uh, have been using it. Um, I mean, I feel like a lot of the, the, the tools we've been using for digitization have just been kind of intentionally abandoning us because like they are following a different community. We happen to be using their tools sometimes, but we are not the ones they're being made for. Um, so I really kind of encourage our to participate um, in, in tool building for ourselves, like, you know, whether that's programming or just like filing issues or, or requests or offering support. Um, I mean, I think it helps so much because there's this nice social component to, to it uh, where you can just kind of, um, you know, offer, uh, you know, offer support or comments as development is progressing, even if you don't necessarily understand the code, usually you can understand like the, the, the issues and the conversation that's happening around. Um, but like one of the big motivators here uh, was to be able to capture directly to F to FFB and Matroska. Once we had this option, it really improved our workflow significantly. It cut down all the time we needed to like do all the verification of the uncompressed FFB one step. It meant that we were digitizing to much smaller files, so it was I don't know, just like the workflow got so much like you know soon after we realized this is so much nicer because like we are not uh, you know stalled at it all these different points of the step to kind of proceed. <coughs> Yeah, so it's beer board, you can capture a couple of the like a few of the other options. Um, if you're like, I don't need, you know, a lot of people are like, well, it's not supported in Final Cut 7, I'm not going to use it. Well, uh, Final Cut 7 doesn't support you anymore, so you shouldn't use that, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, any questions? Or I'm a bit late and I can get to the next one. Yeah, I always have beer, so I don't have to take beer and then twice. It's a lot of questions have come up, but one thing I wanted to add to this is, as you said, that the vendors are producing software that's not for us. We are allowed to use it, but they move on to their customers and then they drop features necessary for us. At the MediaTek, we stumbled into firmware issues with AV converters for video. And then we looked a bit closer and then we made a list of the results and findings because an upcoming issue that we're right in the middle now is that the AV converters for video signals are actually not being manufactured for really dealing with analog signals anymore. It's like the analog input is getting more of a step job when I speak with vendors of AV converters, it's more of cross conversion from digital to digital and they're dropping certain uh, input formats of pins like S-Video, oh we don't have that uh, anymore. And they're doing a lot of corrections on the analog signal or they're not dealing properly with broken analog signals because they say, nobody's seriously doing this anymore. We, we have it in there, but they, they don't support it really. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the findings that completely also go with what you said, yeah. but on a hardware level, and it's not getting funnier. <laughs> yeah. Not funnier. Yeah. Um, there, there are two comments I forgot to add earlier. Um, one, one of the opportunities I kind of see in this project is because we're just using DMD tools and FFM to, to manage creation of the file. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to grab contextual information from the digitization environment and incorporate that into uh, the file. So, for instance, like within the file, we can sort of tell you about like, the name of the computer that's doing uh, the digitization, uh, some of the capture events, like you know how the CPU is doing during the processing. Um, you know, potentially allowing the logging in of like some of the time-based structure adjustments or over-adjustments so that like you can have a digitization log in the file. I'm 
<coughs> kind of leading to the point of the Stellar Working Group where there's like a bigger conversation about the, the metadata side of Matroska to like, you know, figure out how preservation metadata and like should be structured and defined in Matroska to structure the implement that. <coughs> the other kind of Matroska feature that I've been thinking about in regards to digitization is uh, regards to this kind of feature uh, called ordered additions in Matroska. Um, Matroska has a lot of uh, chaptering features, and I think it's say like this is the, the intro, this is the interview, you know, like on a DVD to make chapters. And I like initially was like that's not really so relevant for analog tape digitization at all because there's no chapters on it. I have nothing to represent. Um, but like I was talking a bit about how there are some concepts of the videotape that have no clarification that can be mechanically understood. Like the video deck can't understand how the audio channel is intended to be presented to the It often, it also can't understand where on the tape the presentation is intended to start and end. So you put a tape in and like our human brain can see, okay, these are color bars and then a slate and black and countdown and more black. And then there's the intended point where the audience is supposed to see, receive the content. And then end, and then there's like black or scatter or whatever else is appealing. When we digitize though, we want to retain the color bars because we want to get that added context of like what has happened to the colors. Like if there is informational slate and countdown, like that's often important to store too. But there's a conflict because we're creating a file that has a presentation that was not the intended presentation to show to the audience. Like, but we, like as archivists, we have to work with it in both ways. We have to have the, you know, the complete part of the digitization and the, the, the resulting work. And like archivists always, you know, feel like they have to make the, the choice which one of these approaches they want to do. Sometimes they just mark in and out, they take the content, sometimes they take the whole thing and deal with the challenges of pulling out the accessible part. Uh, the ordered chapters, in addition to just marking points of time and labeling them, like chapters normally are, you can mark points in time, or in and out, and define an alternate timeline with the feature. So you can, um, so like I ended up uh, testing some files where I say, the presentation is intended to start right at the beginning of the program to end at the end. And then I said, like, this is the default uh, chapter edition. There's, and then I made another chapter edition, which is the whole thing. So when you open it in VLC, it starts directly at the program and ends at the program. Like, it, it acts like an access file that's intended to represent what the audience is intended to see. But in VLC, you can go up to the top, pick the program, and then you see the alternate, and then you can play the whole context in the same single file. Um, I saw the uh, ticket to Augusto Tempeg because it, um, I mean, it acknowledges this, but it treats it like markers in time, not like an adjustment to how the timeline is intended to be used. Uh, the other feature of um, Matroska that I've been thinking about using more in digitization is like when there's a discrepancy between the frame size that's intended to be shown to the audience and uh, what we get. Like we're digitizing 720 by 486, but for most of the monitors that we use at the time, to, to present this video, you are intended to see all the lines. At the bottom, you normally have like head switching, or uh, you'll have like these blank columns on the side, so you'll have like a little black border around it. And Matroska has uh, the feature uh, pixel crop, so you can say like you're not, you don't need to put these black uh, rows and columns into the presentation. You can force the crop. And then also, you might have like head switching at the bottom, which is just throwing like some garbage distractions at the bottom, which are distracting to us as viewers of the content, but at the time, they were in the underscan of the, the television monitor and the audience didn't see it. So in order to better represent the intended presentation, like the pixel cropping features to store an app, like an aperture over the frame, I think would be uh, useful to make a more authentic representation of how the content is intended to be presented. All right, now I've got a tonight's question, then I'll end because I'm familiar with the mic. Um, my question was uh, regarding your recording work workflow. Um, do you digitize and live monitor the, the values here, or do you digitize the material and later is this um, some system set where you can whatever see to the specific positions and find out what's going on there? So is it? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's like one technician uh, who has multiple monitors, so they can see all the content. They're usually using four Mac minis with four black monitors, four monitor bars. So they can see all the streams at once. Um, you know, so they can see like what's ending. Uh, and then the content all gets saved, and then in batches it's uh, run through quality control steps and 
you know, done by um, you know, a different person with a different skill set and workflow, and that person kind of just accepts or rejects the work. And if it's rejected, the source tape goes back to the technician who digitized it, comments on what has to be adjusted, like it's too bright, or the tape has to be cleaned, or we just want to try a second pass because we think this could be better. Um, you know, so we kind of have, I don't know, it's about 20% of the content I think that's rejected. It kind of depends how strict or high your expectations are where you, where you set this bar. But don't let everything in, you know, take a look and feel free to, to send things back to the process if you think there can be improvements. Um, for instance, the clip I was showing at the beginning, uh, this clip, it has a massive head plug for five, five minutes in the content. and. The technician didn't notice when we were digitizing and we broadcast the material like this. Uh, um, you know, it, it's pretty crucial to do quality control because this entire thing was repaired by just some isopropyl alcohol and a wipe to clean the deck and we redid the tape like this. Had nothing of this the second pass. It was just because we had a dirty head um, in, in the deck. Has that answer? Good? Good. Thanks, John. Is that right? You got the schedule. Yeah, sure. All right, John. Yeah. Guys, everybody, here's John Martinez. <laughs>